Now, quasi-linear preferences and a discrete good is a nice setup for understanding the gross surplus and the net consumer surplus. However, working with infinite divisibility is way more common and much simpler. Therefore, let's have a look at the model where preferences are still quasi-linear, but good one is now infinitely divisible. This is the model we will consider. It's a two goods model where both goods are infinitely divisible. Our focus is on the demand for good one, so we keep normalizing the price of good two to be equal to one. P1x1 plus x2 is equal to m. We still have quasi-linear preferences and they are well behaved. V is strictly increasing and strictly concave. Also, we normalize V of zero to be equal to zero. The first order condition for optimal choice is MU1 over MU2 must be equal to P1 over P2. In our setup, MU1 is the derivative of V and MU2 is equal to one, and we have normalized P2 to be equal to one. Therefore, the first order condition simplifies to V prime of X1 is equal to P1. As an example, say that V of X1 is equal to the square root of X1. This function is strictly increasing and strictly convex. The derivative of the square root of X1 is one divided by two times the square root of X1. So the first order condition becomes P1 is equal to one over two square root of X1. The demand function is a function where x1 is determined from p1. In this expression, we have p1 as a function of x1. If we observe a consumer choosing x1 units of good 1, we know that the price must have been p1 equal to 1 over 2 times square root of x1. This relationship is called the inverse demand function. This also means that if I want to draw the demand curve with p1 on the y-axis, I simply draw a graph of p prime. In my example, with v equal to square root of x1, the demand curve is the graph of 1 over 2 square root of x1. Note that since v is strictly concave, v prime must be strictly decreasing. That is, the demand curve will be strictly downward sloping as expected. Now here is the important point. When good one was discrete, we were able to find the gross surplus from the demand curve. We found that if the consumer chooses x1 units of good 1, then the gross surplus, v of x1, is equal to the area under the demand curve for x1 up to the optimal choice. Let's see if we can generalize this principle to the case where x1 is infinitely divisible. So x1 is now the optimal choice of good 1. Let's check if the gross surplus, v of x1, is still equal to the area under the demand curve. In this case, the demand curve P of X1 is smooth and we need an integral to determine the area. We need to integrate P1 from zero to X1. Note that I have relabeled X1 to T inside this integral since I use X1 to denote the optimal choice of good one. X1 is not just any quantity of good one. You should never have the same symbol as a limit in an integral and as an integration variable. A problem easily solved by renaming the integration variable. I picked T because, well, it was the first symbol that popped into my mind. With quasi-linear preferences, we know that the inverse demand function is V prime. When we calculate an integral, we find the primitive function of the integral, the function inside the integral. Well, a primitive function of the derivative v prime is v. That follows from the definition of a primitive function. To evaluate the integral, we need to evaluate the primitive function at the upper limit x1 and then subtract the primitive function evaluated at the lower limit. Since v of 0 is 0, we see that the integral is v of x1. So it doesn't matter if good one is discrete or infinitely divisible. The gross surplus V of X1 is the area under the demand curve. V of X1, the area under the demand curve is the gross surplus. This is how much X1 units of good one is worth to the consumer. She only pays P1 times X1 and as before, P of X1 minus P1 X1 is defined as the consumer's surplus or the net consumer surplus from consuming X1 units of good one. Here is a picture and a demand curve. At the price P1, the individual consumes X1 units of good one. The net consumer surplus is then the area between the demand curve and the horizontal line intersecting P1. 
The source of the consumer surplus is simply the fact that consumers are typically willing to pay more for goods than what they actually have to pay. Imagine finding your way out of the desert with no water, entering a village where you buy a bottle of water from a local vendor. Your consumer surplus will be huge. On the other hand, if you're on the fence if you should buy a certain good or not, then the consumer surplus is small or even zero. It should also be mentioned that the consumer surplus is defined from the non-linear part of a quasi-linear utility function. If preferences are not quasi-linear, then there is no function B and strictly speaking no consumer surplus. However, in many cases, a quasi-linear utility function is a good approximation when we want to study the demand of an individual good, bundling all other goods into what we call good 2. Remember that with quasi-linear preferences, there is no income effect in good 1. x1 will not depend on m. Therefore, the approximation is only appropriate if the income effect is small. Interpreting the area under the demand curve as consumer surplus only makes sense for goods with a small income effect. If good one is, say, luxury cars, then you will likely not be able to interpret the area as a consumer surplus unless you're extremely rich.